popping up from town to town, state to state, the reconstruction following the Civil War faced one sole threat. Bands of white supremacists, donning masks and robes, were terrorizing the freedmen. All the struggle and hardship, all the progress to be made from the defeat of the Confederacy was facing a fearsome backlash. It stood for white supremacy and denigration of persons of color. It was little local chapters rearing their heads across the country, and they went by the name of the Ku Klux Klan. America's history is inestimably twined with fraught and deadly race relations, and no organization has been a more phosphorus symbol of that than the KKK. Welcome to History on Fleek. Today we examine the hideous truths of the Ku Klux Klan. The white supremacist organization known as the Ku Klux Klan has existed in the United States since the late 1800s. It has a long, storied history that goes hand in hand with the history of the United States. Initially, the group was formed in Pulaski, Tennessee in 1865. Quite tragically, the destructive organization was born in an oblivious innocence. A bunch of bored, overeducated, understimulated white Confederate veterans started a fraternal social club. The form of this club was akin to the Sons of Malta, a mid-19th century fraternal order that essentially spoofed others like the Freemasons. For example, the Sons of Malta's Grand Master would salute with fingers in the air, thumbs joined at the temples. There is no evidence the Sons of Malta were prejudicially motivated or outwardly violent in any way. They had ballots and lodges, but their actions showed no violent bigotry. However, the six Confederate officers who started the Ku Klux Klan had soon created their own Frankenstein's monster. Once robes, hoods, rituals, and mysticism were rooted in the Klan, several such social clubs popped up across the South, and there was nothing playful or social about it. This first Klan of the late 1800s was a lightning rod for those promoting white supremacy and resistance during the Reconstruction era, and they were willing to use violence for their aims. Following the Civil War, Confederate soldiers roamed many states, fully armed, and lawlessness abound. Across the 1860s and 70s, the Ku Klux Klan was a secret vigilante group targeting freedmen and their supporters. The Frankenstein's monster was at large in the general public, using violence, threats, and murder against persons of color and any supporting them, all to restore white supremacy. The first Klan's tenure is regarded by many as ending around 1872, following considerable institutional pushback. The Enforcement Acts of 1870 and 1871 were passed to protect African American rights and hand-in-hand -hand prosecute and suppress Klan activities. Ironically, the Klan's initial 19th century wave was as much a failure as a success in achieving its aims. While it did damage black political representation and leadership through its violence and assassinations, the backlash through federal law soon left the Klan a suppressed political failure. Tragically, the Klan would have a light shone on its darkness, and no less from Hollywood, of all places. D.W. Griffith's film, The Birth of a Nation, was released in 1915 and made the dire choice of glamorizing the Klan. In Griffith's vision, not only were there numerous depictions of African Americans as sexually aggressive towards white women, many were portrayed by white actors in blackface. The film would double down its abject racism by portraying the Ku Klux Klan as valiant heroes against African Americans. In The Birth of a Nation, the KKK were upholders of American values, maintaining white supremacy and defenders of white women. What was a box office success despite its damaging imagery and message, it proved wholly popular with white audiences, contributed to racial segregation, and emboldened the Klan. The cross-burning and white robes seen in the film would inspire Klan iterations to come. Frankenstein's monster had been revived. Imagery has an important strand in the story of the Ku Klux Klan. The adoption of masks and robes for their membership was as much visual as it was ritual. It's long been noted, though, many wished to cover their faces when doing things they were ashamed of in broad daylight. The Klan's choice of attacks during the night was to heighten the drama. KKK writers would claim to some that they were the ghosts of Confederate soldiers. Mysticism has always been an aim of the Klan's presentation. The imagery of the cross on fire keeps in line with the pseudo-Christian messaging. Ultimately, the Klan's actions don't amount to more than Christian terrorism. The burning of a cross is usually accompanied by the singing of hymns and prayer. 
Yet, quite tragically, the symbolism of the KKK wouldn't take a life of its own till the 20th century. The choice of white pointed hoods and robes, mass parades and cross burning all begins with the birth of a nation. Around this time, the Klan would also adopt its official emblem of the Blood Drop Cross, more pseudo-Christianity in the name of harming others. In the 1920s, with imagery at its peak, the KKK's membership was at its peak, estimated between 3 to 6 million. This 20s peak was also the Klan's most ideologically grotesque. The list of what the organization stood against is fearsome. Black, Catholic, Jew, Darwin, modernity, liberal, communist, and foreigner. In the 1920s, the second clan operated like a modern business with paid recruiters, and it spread to every state and many notable cities. Only a collapse caused by internal criminal behavior would see the decline of the second clan around 1940. Primarily, the actions of the KKK were to upend the lives of persons of color. Violence would be assured from the earliest rendition of the Ku Klux Klan. In 1876, the Carolinas reported 197 murders and over 500 cases of aggravated assault in 18 months. Coordinated attacks were not only against individual persons of color, but their community at large. Black political leaders, family heads, leaders of community groups, and churches were prominent targets of the Klan. Before the presidential election in 1868, Louisiana recorded over 2,000 people harmed or killed by the Klan's intervention. This was all done to suppress the black vote. Violence and hate crime has always been the modus operandi of the Klan. The organization falls by definition under the label of a domestic terrorism organization. Arguably, its most heinous act in a lurid lineage of many is the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing of 1963. Using 19 sticks of dynamite, four Klan members attacked a church that took the lives of four African-American girls, no older than 14. As the civil rights movement in the United States began to grow across the 1950s into the 60s, the Klan committed a series of notorious homicides of persons of color. In a time when Klan members were lynching people, bombing their homes, and committing outright murder, political strings were pulled. Klan members were able to form allegiances with state governor offices in both Mississippi and Alabama. Birmingham, Alabama was so viciously hostile across the 1950s, the city was nicknamed Bombingham for its consistent bombing of black people's homes. Despite a reputation based on terrorizing lives and inflicting violence, the KKK held a profound influence across the American populace. During its iteration from the 19th century through to its 6,000 or so members today, the KKK has attracted high-profile figures over the years. At its Reconstructionist birth, the initial membership was rife with soldiers of the Confederacy. The first Grand Wizard of the Klan, Nathan Bedford Forrest, was a general of the Confederacy who would make much success of slave trading and cotton plantations. In more recent times, another former Grand Wizard, David Duke, would go on to the Louisiana House of Representatives for the Republican Party. His writing and political stance are littered with anti-Semitism and racist tropes. Duke would hold office for three years and make two separate turns for the presidential nomination. Incredibly, the longest-serving U.S. Senator in history, Robert Byrd, started his political career by leading a local KKK chapter in the 1940s. Byrd was a career-long Democrat who started his career opposing the Civil Rights Act and supporting Vietnam, yet would finish his tenure and life opposing segregation and racism. There have been claims that across the 1930s, as many as 75 congressmen, along with 16 senators and 11 governors, were Klan members. The bizarre name of the organization has always been a point of fascination. It is alleged to be derived from the Greek word for circle, kiklos, and the English word clan. This was chosen supposedly because it sounded mysterious and exotic to its founders. Mystique and secrecy have consistently been used to allure those to the clan, hence its use of pageants, parades, initiations, and even disturbingly, children's books. Its understood code is used between members to identify one another within a conversation. The acronym AYAK stands for Are You a Klansman? And a greeting can be completed with the acronym AKIA, A Klansman Am I. 
Within its self-created bizarre lore, the clan even has its own terminology all beginning with the letters KL. A treasurer is called a clavi. A local organization is called a claver. A secretary is called a cligrap. Yet, to most tastes, any and all clan members are just a bunch of places clastered. This is History on Fleek, and we'll see you next time.